My name is Tony Busalaki, and I'm the president of the University Corporation for Atmospheric Research, or UCAR. And uh, welcome to UCAR's briefing on forecasting the road ahead, advances in weather research, and the transportation sector. I would like to thank Senator Gary Peters and his staff for making this room available uh, to us this afternoon. Hope you had the opportunity to get some lunch. Please do uh, take advantage of that. And our format this afternoon is uh, you'll hear from our four speakers, and then there'll be time at the end uh, to answer your questions. For those of you that are not familiar with UCAR, uh, UCAR is a nonprofit consortium of 117 universities in North America that uh, grant advanced degrees in the atmospheric and related sciences. UCAR also manages the National Center for Atmospheric Research on behalf of the National Science Foundation. The research conducted by the UCAR community helps to inform decisions across a whole range of societal benefit areas in areas of weather, water, climate, and solar storms. And several times a year, we host a briefing here on Capitol Hill to discuss the latest science in these areas that's of importance to the nation's policymakers. And that brings us to today's briefing topic. And we'll be hearing from the four experts in front of you about a significant challenge to public safety and the U.S. economy, and that being the impact of weather events on our highways and streets. Weather has a major impact on road safety and mobility. Adverse weather conditions are responsible for thousands of deaths and millions of dollars of economic costs each year. As you will hear, vehicle accidents are by far the largest cause of weather-related deaths in the country. An estimated 445,000 people are injured and 6,000 killed each year due to weather-related vehicle accidents. The development of more accurate and detailed forecasts is vital for public safety and continued economic growth. Whether it is a family going out on their annual vacation or a company trying to move goods and services, the return on investment is substantial when it comes to improving forecasts for our nation's roadways. Today we are at a threshold of a transportation revolution consisting of smart cars and smart roads. Drivers have access to GPS systems and apps for the fastest routes through congested areas. Electronic signs along highways provide motorists with updates about weather and traffic delays, accidents, and detours. Engineers, as you will hear also, are designing new technologies that will enable connected vehicles to exchange information about road conditions and with transportation officials. Eventually, automated vehicles will entirely transform our surface and near-surface transportation system. To ensure that we navigate these changes safely, it will be critical to invest in better forecasting technologies. Scientists in federal agencies, the private sector, and in academia are working together with advanced computer models to predict important variables, such as pavement temperatures at specific locations. They're also researching technologies to gather information about local weather conditions from networks of road sensors, mesonets, autonomous vehicles, uh, in order to improve the forecasts for the road ahead. The goal is to alert drivers about hazardous weather in their vicinity. The new te technology is also providing transportation officials with information to help them make decisions to enhance road safety and mobility, such as where and when to treat roads for a winter storm. As I hear today, the highways of the future are going to be different than the highways of the past. This is not your father's old highway. So now is the time to in, uh, invest in research, technology, and infrastructure to ensure the safety of all of us on the roads and to keep our economy growing. I mean, having lived in D.C. for 34 years, you know, I know what it's like on the Beltway at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So this is a topic of importance to a lot of us. Our panelists today will talk about these challenges as well as technologies to improve road forecasting. And with us this afternoon, in the order that I'll be speaking, is William Mahoney. Bill is the Director of the Research Applications Laboratory at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder. He's been involved in research and development activities for more than three decades. He has directed weather research programs in aviation, surface transportation, agriculture, intelligent forecast systems, wildland, fire prediction, and renewable energy. Next to Bill is Kathy Alanius, who is the Project Manager for Winter Research at the Wyoming Department of Transportation. She has worked with the Wyoming Department of Transportation for more than 25 years, including the last 14 as member of the win Winter Research Team, where she manages nearly 450 miles of state snow fence. 
She's a member of the Snow and Ice Cooperative Program of the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials and is presented worldwide on winter maintenance activities. Next to uh, Kathy is Dr. Andy Alden, who is the Executive Director of the I-81 Corridor Coalition at Virginia Tech Transportation Institute. Andy focuses on advancing safe and sustainable transportation through the application of emerging and alternative technologies. His recent research includes low-speed autonomous vehicles, road weather safety, applied road salt impacts, and the use of drones in support of surface transportation. And wrapping it up, it will be John Quant, is Vice President of City Solutions at Ford Motor Company. John leads Ford's global efforts to partner with municipalities to identify key urban mobility needs while also working to create, pilot, and implement new mobility solutions in cities worldwide. Prior to his role, he served as Ford's Director of Global Strategy and worked in Ford's Asia Pacific Group for over 10 years. And we begin with Bill Mahoney. Bill? All right, thank you, Tony. All right, let me get acclimated here. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm, uh, I'm gonna set the discussion context for the rest of our speakers. And so let me start with some uh, startling statistics, which Tony mentioned. You hear about certain weather fatalities on a regular basis on the news. And you think about, for example, in terms of cold, this, these are 10-year averages, about 29 individuals are killed per year in cold weather events, flooding about 71, hurricanes 105 per year, tornadoes 110, heat 124. Well, now if you think about what, we hear about these regularly, but what we don't hear about is what happens on the roadway. So here, this graph now is scaled so up to 7,000, so you can kind of see what happens here. But look at the average number of fatalities that occur during poor weather and road conditions. So, you know, we're talking about almost 6,000 per year. If you total all the major weather categories that result in death, it's about 540 per year. So what's really happening here? Drivers often blunder into road weather situations, unaware of the conditions, and they're often unequipped to deal with them. The good news is that new and emerging uh, weather communications and sensing technologies have significant potential to improve road safety and mobility. But now we're also entering the era of automated vehicles, which is gonna make this challenge even greater. But more on that later. There are also non-fatal uh, non, uh, type of impacts of weather on the roadways. For example, there are about 5.7 vehicle crashes. About 22% of those occur each year from poor weather and road conditions. That's about 1.26 million. On average, about 445,000 people are injured in weather-related crashes. But then you look at what happens with moving goods and transport across the highway systems. The commercial vehicle operators suffer about 32 billion vehicle hours of de delay uh, due to weather per year. And obviously we can't mitigate the weather as much as we'd like to think we could, but mitigating a, f a fraction of those delays through better snow and ice control, for example, or drainage to reduce flooding hazards uh, would make significant savings. So to begin to address a lot of these staggering statistics, several studies were conducted over the last 15 years. There was the National Academy study where the weather meets the road which I have a copy of here, which is focused on a research agenda for improving road weather services. We had an American Meteorological Society forum on weather in the highways, and the Office of Federal Coordinator for Meteorology conducted a national user needs assessment for surface transportation, which included transit, rail, pipelines, roadways, and marine, and the number of requirements that were identified for improved uh, weather and, and uh, uh, service transportation services was pretty remarkable. And a lot of those needs are still unmet. So the National Academy of Sciences study, the overarching recommendation was for the U US DOT to establish a focused, coordinated national road weather R&D and researched operations program driven by stakeholder needs. And the study also noted that the national transportation system you know, really must transition from being a very reactive system 
where people kind of just drive and then they get the weather and road conditions that they encounter when they encounter it, to a proactive system in which the level of service of the highway is managed more proactively, people become more aware of what hazards they're about to blunder into. Commercial vehicle operators, for example, would have alternative routing to maximize the throughput. So we must make this system more proactive. And that's certainly gonna be an issue for automated vehicles. The National Academy study led to the establishment of the Road Weather Research and Development Program uh, when we had the Safety Lou Transportation Reauthorization Bill. And that program was focused on enhancing safety, capacity, and mobility, expanding road weather research and development, minimizing environmental impacts of snow and ice control chemicals, and promoting technology transfer to enhance private sector capabilities. So this, this relatively modest program was, was quite successful. One of the big success stories was the development of a decision support system that improved pavement condition prediction and snow and ice control guidance for state DOTs. These new capabilities were also adopted by the private sector and became new business opportunities. So a good example of the technology transfer aspect of this was the fact that in some benefit studies that were conducted by the Federal Highway Administration, it was shown that Indiana DOT saved about $12 million in its first year of using this decision support technology by minimizing chemical usage, optimizing staffing uh, during snow and ice control maintenance activities. And it wasn't just Indiana that saved millions of dollars per year. Minnesota saved about $9 million, and several other states also experienced significant savings. So the return on investment from this program was realized almost immediately. The formal uh, US DOT road weather R&D program ended in 2011 after uh, safety lieu um, expired, but the societal and industry needs and driver expectations for improvement continue. Now we're entering the area of automated vehicle technologies, which is driving the requirements for much higher fidelity road weather capabilities. As this slide shows, road weather information is required for decision guidance for drivers, advanced driver assistance systems, improving travel time estimation, supporting incident and emergency management, optimizing routing guidance for commercial vehicles, winter maintenance, snow and ice control, as I mentioned, and typical go, no-go decisions for vehicle operations. And that, of course, will be true when we introduce more automation, as there will be certain conditions when certain vehicles won't be certified or able to operate. So we must be ready and prepared for a future transportation system. As Tony mentioned, our future system is not what our, our, our grandparents and our, even our parents uh, have experienced. So headlines are now really beginning to tell the stories of how challenged automation systems will be in inclement weather. This will impact all modes of transportation, including ride sharing, transit, personal vehicles, and commercial vehicle operations. A recent Associated Press story listed industry challenges in bringing automation into operations. The headline was five reasons why autonomous cars aren't coming anytime soon. And believe it or not, the top reason was snow and weather. The second reason was pavement lines, which of course they disappear when you have snow and ice on the road as well. But then there's, uh, there's other maintenance issues associated with those that are non-weather related. And then dealing with human drivers, left turn <laughs> operations, and consumer acceptance. So um, this is an emerging problem. Autonomous vehicles at, at this point have mainly been developed and tested in fair weather climates, but certainly there w could be some train wrecks coming up um, when this testing moves into areas of inclement weather. So to summarize, additional coordinated and targeted investments in road weather research, development, and technology transfer are required to improve roadway safety, mobility and efficiency, and to support the evolution towards automation. Appropriate R&D topics include pavement prediction, testing of automated vehicle sensors in adverse weather, simulation of complex environmental conditions along roadways, and assessing the value of vehicle data sharing, uh, just to name a few. There are substantial research questions that warrant a national coordinated research program 
and the emergence of automation adds a significant amount of complexity given the requirements for operating in poor weather conditions. So thank you very much for your attention on this. So I believe we're gonna take questions at the end. So I'm gonna swing over now and introduce Kathy Alenius from the Wyoming Department of Transportation. Thank you, Bill, and welcome everyone. Um, my name is Kathy Alanius, as you said, and I'm with the Wyoming Department of Transportation. So there are many challenges that face transportation agencies or DOTs as the technology involved with connected and autonomous vehicles speeds along. These challenges can be roughly grouped into three main areas, infrastructure, weather, and humans. Oh, there it is. Connected and autonomous vehicles have the potential to improve safety and mobility on our transportation network. While the terms are often used together, they are different concepts and will have different effects on departments of transportation. Connected vehicles require transportation agencies to deploy new roadside technology to share information with the vehicles on the roadway. Drivers can use this information to make safe travel decisions and improve their situational awareness. It is not yet clear what manufacturers of autonomous vehicles will require of DOTs, but at this time we know that pavement markings, travel messaging, and weather notifications will be critical elements that need to be addressed. To make connected and autonomous vehicles practical on all roads, a network of sensors or roadside units will be required to communicate road conditions and messaging to other vehicles as well as to the DOTs. This communication can happen between two vehicles, as in a V2V situation, or in a V2I or I2V um, scenario where the information is shared between the vehicle and the infrastructure, such as a transportation management center. Wyoming is one of three US DOT pilot project sites that's designed to spur the early development of connected vehicle technology in, in its deployment, improve and measure safety, mobility, and environmental benefits, and resolve the issues of technical, institutional, and financial arrangements. The Wyoming Connective um, Vehicle Pilot is conceptualized on the screen. You can see um, Vehicle 2 or Vehicle 1 is sending out a distress message that could be related to weather or work zones. Oops. Hold on. There we go work zones related to um, weather or work zones. The, um, this message is then received by vehicle two, which as the vehicle two continues moving to the left, it will um, broadcast a signal for a prescribed distance or time. Vehicle three traveling in the opposite direction and approaching the distressed, distressed vehicle or location will be alerted to the problem ahead so it can slow down or take evasive measures. These vehicles will deliver the distressed vehicle's location to a roadside unit where it will be sent to the transportation management center and on to emergency managers. It is hoped that this use of connected vehicle technology will improve emergency responses to incidents. In urban areas, connected vehicles are, are more likely to encounter another connected vehicle, and there's more infrastructure in place for the roadside units needed to relay messages. In rural areas like Wyoming, infrastructure will need to be built as well as maintained. Communications can be done by satellite in a remote area, but that too has its cost. And beyond the infrastructure of roadside units, there's existing, the existing infrastructure. Transportation agencies from villages to states build and maintain roads differently. It's called the level of service and it can vary not only from road to road, but on along the same route. Will the remnants of road treatments for snow and ice pose guidance problems if they're not cleared away? Will DOTs be expected to maintain the roadways for our connected and autonomous vehicles, or will connected and autonomous vehicles learn to drive on what currently exists? The current practice in winter maintenance relies on traffic to help clear the road, but if autonomous vehicles aren't driving, what changes will need to be made to those practices? 
And then maintenance practices are different and, and, and not consistent. Pavement markings are different and may wear off at different rates. Where there's curb and gutter can vary within a city. Crack ceiling can create lines that may be misinterpreted by connected and autonomous vehicle sensors. Driver messages can vary within a state and from state to state. There are mobile work zones that require a temporary closure of a lane. This may be picked up by a connected vehicle, but by the time it passes the message along to the next connected vehicle, the work zone is in a different location. How and where will these messages be verified? For example, potholes. Thanks to the freeze-thaw cycle, it's pothole season, at least in some climates. Departments of transportation may not be able to get a pothole patch due to temperature, weather, or limited personnel. But when the conditions are right, they're out there trying to do their best to get them filled. A human driver can choose to avoid potholes by swerving or slowing down, and hopefully avoiding vehicle damage. Autonomous vehicles may not detect a pothole, and there are already vehicles on the road that may not allow you to swerve to avoid it. Vehicle damage from potholes costs the U.S. approximately $3 billion a year. And weather, or any weather that isn't dry and sunny, will be a problem for all autonomous vehicles and possibly connected vehicles. And while the, atmospheric, while the atmosphere may be dry and sunny, the road may not be. While atmospheric forecasting models have greatly improved, road weather modeling is currently hampered by the lack of current road and subsurface information, as well as the other factors that are needed to create the models. Will models reach the point where road weather forecasting can incorporate the local terrain and microclimate anomalies? Connected vehicles should help in assisting, uh, to assist in locating the local anomalies, anomalies. But what about quick moving storms? Are all road weather impacts, no matter the size, to be reported? Who will be responsible for the accuracy of this information? And lastly, humans. Even with weather forecasts improving and the increased ability of the weather enterprise to get the message out to the public, DOTs still see people making bad decisions when it comes to transportation and weather. And while we assume that the driver will take over when conditions warrant, we currently have people that overdrive their all-wheel or four-wheel drive vehicles, thinking that it can get it through, their vehicles can get them through anything Mother Nature throws at them. We also have freight drivers who ignore high wind warnings because they have um, delivery schedules. Will water sta standing water over lane markings instantly throw control of the vehicle to the driver who may still be texting? Or will the vehicle be able to maneuver this by itself? How quickly are DOTs expected to get the word out to drivers when there may not be any collaboration of the event? Driver expectations of not only road conditions, but the ability of their vehicles to handle any road condition continues to increase. These expectations, coupled with the tremendous advances in automotive technology, have placed DOTs in a challenging position. To be honest, most states are not nimble enough to keep pace with the legislation um, that needed to keep, um, keep up with these advances. Upgrades to infrastructure are necessary, and the technology that can benefit us by making roads safer will likely require additional funding. That may be the biggest challenge to full implementation of connected and autonomous vehicles. And thank you. And with that, I'll bring up um, Andy Alden of the Virginia, Trans Virginia Tech Transportation Institute. Thank you, Kathy. Well, I'm Andy Alden, and uh, my presentation today will focus on how advanced transportation systems are affected by weather and how these new technologies might be used to mitigate some of these effects. Modern cars are incredibly complex machines. Since the early 90s, an increasingly diverse array of sensors, processors, and high-speed networks has enabled safety systems such as anti-lock brakes and crash avoidance protections that most of us have come to rely upon. As we move into an era of expanded automation, we're seeing this complexity grow. At VTTI, we recently uh, acquired the low-speed autonomous vehicle at the, at the bottom right of the screen. Um, 
to support an ongoing mobility research that we have going on. It's uh, interesting to note that even though this vehicle is only intended for low speed, shuttle type operation at a maximum speed of 25 miles an hour, it features eight LIDAR units, two external cameras, high accuracy GPS, and other sensors to enable its autonomous operation. It's also interesting and relevant to today's discussion that the sole purpose of the, the little windshield wiper you see on the front windshield there is for the sensors on board. It has nothing to do with the passengers. It's only to clear, keep a clear view ahead of the road. Um, while these sensors are required for safe navigation, their availability also presents us some opportunities to extend our utilization for purposes other than those originally intended. The nature of vehicles and their many sensors and systems makes them very useful as mobile weather and road condition probes. Sensors may provide direct measurements such as temperature or solar radiation. Visual sensors may provide information on lighting and the presence of fog or smoke. Onboard motion sensors may be used to identify dangerous crosswinds and hydroplaning hazards, and activation of safety systems such as wipers and analog brakes may indicate that roads are slippery. As part of some unrelated testing that we were performing at the Smart Roads test facility, we noticed that more rotation of the drive wheels on the vehicle was required to cover the same distance when traveling uphill rather than downhill. This suggested that some small amount of slippage was occurring between the tire and pavement that was measurable with sensors but was unapparent otherwise. We wondered if the amount of slippage that was occurring might, be, might vary depending on whether road conditions were dry, wet, icy, contaminated. In research funded by the Federal Highway Administration, we later found that we were able to directly measure uh, slippery road conditions in real time using only those factory onboard sensors something done previously using an expensive network of sparsely located roadside sensors and predictive climatic models. We envision that one day this method will be used to identify dangerous, uh, dangerous slippery segments of road uh, and that this information will be shared uh, with others on the road to prevent uh, crashes and accidents. Um, whether human or machine, these drivers can be impacted by this and can be forewarned. The increased use of advanced driver assistance and automated driving systems on our roads presents opportunities as well as new challenges. These systems go well beyond the safety systems mentioned previously to assist with or assume some of the driving tasks such as lane keeping and maintaining the proper distance from vehicles ahead. This level of control requires a detailed understanding of the driving environment provided by a variety of different types of sensors. This diagram illustrates the type of sensor array that is used by automated vehicles, in this case a Tesla Model X. These include GPS, several visual camera sensors, short and long range ra radar, and ultrasonic sensors. Conceptually and to some degree in practice, these are, there are two basic approaches to automated driving. The first is based wholly on real-time data acquisition from onboard systems with in-the-moment navigation decisions. This is the DARPA approach, where competing vehicles were sent into a challenging environment like the desert, and the winner survived it to exit at the other side. This is a very vehicle-centered approach with little dependency upon maps or other external data sources. In the second approach, wayfinding is accomplished by using a pre-existing 3D virtual map of the, of the driving environment with waypoint references. This map is highly dependent upon real-time communication and updating of the virtual map using onboard sensors of the, of the subject vehicle and other vehicles, in effect crowdsourcing. In practice, most automated driving systems employ a hybrid of these two approaches where pre-existing map data are improved with real-time information from an array of onboard sensors and external sources, and the rules of the road are imposed to allow the vehicle to drive on. Weather may impair automatic driving systems in a variety of ways. Sensors may be obstructed by ice or road salt accretions. The effectiveness of visual, LIDAR, and sometimes radar systems may be diminished by precipitation, fog, smoke, and lighting conditions. Lane markings, critical to navigation in many, in many systems, may disappear under snow. And intersection signals may become obscure because of the, light of, uh, because of the lack of heat emitted by the newer LED lamps. Terrestrial communication may be affected by heavy precipitation, and even satellite-based communication systems such as GPS may be impacted by space weather phenomena such as solar flares. Thankfully, we can depend upon automated driving systems to hand over control of the vehicle back safely back to the human behind the wheel, or can we? 
This requires that automated driving systems not only understand the world outside the vehicle, but also the state of the human behind the wheel. This is not a trivial undertaking. The scenario that many believe will be the most challenging are those edge cases, and that's what you're seeing in the video that's on the screen right now. These are defined by that one line of code that is yet to be written, that decides an action based on some threshold of confidence. In this case of the Tesla here operating on autopilot, the wrong decision was made. The system didn't know what it didn't know as it followed lane markings directly into a jersey barrier in a construction zone. While not weather related, it does illustrate how uncertainty in real life driving environments can cause problems. There's no doubt that sensor technology and computational abilities such as machine learning or artificial intelligence will overcome some of these challenges. Waymo, that's out, uh, uh, Google's autonomous vehicle initiative, shows in this animation how their uh, artificial intelligence systems can remove snow noise to get a clearer picture of the road ahead. Uh, the hype surrounding autonomous vehicles has overshadowed the simple utility of connected vehicle technology. This is unfortunate. There's many situations where automated driving system technology alone cannot prevent a crash where connectivity could. I recorded this vehicle on my own dash cam as I drove to work one day. The video is playing at faster than normal speed. I don't normally drive that fast. But notice how the, the front end of my, my truck dips down at the end as I stop. It gives you an idea of how hard the stop actually was so that I didn't hit the bus. Under different circumstances, say limited visibility, the outcome could have been very different. Uh, at VTTI, we have a lot of videos showing real life crashes and near crashes like this. I chose this one to illustrate the point because about two years ago, I was the principal investigator in our project where we demonstrated how vehicle to vehicle communication, in our case, dedicated short range communication or DSRC, could be used to prevent crashes from school buses, crashes with school buses that were stopped for student boarding. Connectivity is, um, well, next. Connectivity is particularly useful for improving safety with regard to weather-related hazards. These include fog and smoke and slippery roads, all of which are difficult and are expensive to detect using roadside sensors, although easily detected by probe vehicles that can communicate the location of these hazards to others. Other temporal hazards not suitable for detection by sensors such as snow drifts, work zones, installed vehicles can be recorded by drivers through a Waze-like interface. Connectivity is also critical for providing the signal phase and timing information required to navigate through signalized intersections. This is a particularly challenging problem since automated driving systems have trouble acquiring this data visually because of visibility issues and poor signal con uh, configuration standards. We should also look and be looking forward to the, to the weather issues faced by unmanned aerial systems as we look to the future, particularly those that operate at low altitudes for delivery of goods and transport of people. Amazon, Google Wing, Airbus, and others have a new vision for the airspace below 400 foot in elevation. It's likely that these types of operations will be more integrated with ground traffic than they are with the FAA controlled airspace above. And that ground level weather such as urban winds will have a big impact on the viability and safety of these systems. And finally, what kind of weather data is required to enable this type of scenario? Uh, that's the end of my talk. Um, just want to point out that's my, that's my parents beside that Tesla there. I fulfilled my dad's bucket list by taking him for a ride in insane mode. And I also heard words I've never heard come out of my mother's uh, mouth before when I took her for a ride. So. <laughs> With that, I need to, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce John Quant from, uh, from Ford City Solutions. Do you have it on autopilot too? <laughs> uh, once you get used to that olive pot, it's hard to get, uh, to get away from it. Good afternoon, everybody, and, and um, thank you for coming uh, out today. Um, the, uh, the group that I'm part of was an LLC that was created uh, just a couple of years ago to really focus on cities uh, and the mobility needs that are there. Uh, if you think about our relationships, we, we tend to focus here at a federal level in D.C., at a state level. Uh, we have great city relationships in places where we have plants or uh, municipal contracts for, let's say, police vehicles, muni vehicles, but we really didn't have a good understanding of what was going on in um, municipality, municipalities and, and the mobility uh, challenges they had. So my group was formed a couple of years ago to actually go out, begin to engage with cities in that regard and really understand it. So I'm, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that here. Um, this is an ad uh, from a periodical that 
as I look through the audience, that many of you might not have heard of. Uh, it's called the Saturday Evening Post. And um, this was from 1920, I, I think it's 1925, 29. But uh, it was uh, kind of re-found uh, or rediscovered by our former CEO, Alan Mulally. And he, he found the message so compelling uh, because it's something that, that almost Henry Ford would have written himself, this notion about opening the highways to all mankind. If you think about uh, what he ushered in uh, in the early 1900s and really democratizing transportation, you have to envision an America where most people didn't travel very much 30 miles beyond their home, at least not on a frequent basis. And what uh, the automobile, uh, an affordable automobile at about roughly seven to $800, uh, afforded in terms of greater mobility for people. Um, it it uh, ushered in the creation of a large middle class with a $5 day wage uh, that Henry Ford instituted. So a lot of things that the automobile changed and this notion about uh, democratizing transportation is something that's, that's still very uh, prevalent in the company and, and with our current chairman, Bill Ford. So we opened the highways to all mankind, and then we uh, filled them, right? So this, what you see here is three pictures of, of the main artery going into Boston. Uh, before there were highways, somewhere probably in the 50s after the uh, first Highway uh, Construction Act. And then uh, something, again, judging by the, the vehicles on the road, uh, probably an 80s or 90s shot of the congestion uh, that Boston experiences. And this is not different than any other major municipality in the country. Uh, the car has become central uh, to not only suburban sprawl, but um, the only guarantee that some most people have in terms of getting from place A to place B, point A to point B, with some assurity. And uh, what we're seeing now, if you, if you think about fast forwarding to today, that um, the thing that the automobile was designed for um, is, is better in so many respects from a safety, fuel economy, uh, uh, luxurious features. But if you're trying to get across town here in DC or if you're trying to get home as, as it was referred to, you know, in, in the local area through the Beltway, um, it's not doing a very good job of that, at least not expeditiously. You may be very comfortable, well ensconced in your own cabin, but you know, when I lived here before and I lived in Potomac, uh, I lived 17 miles away from the city, and that was an hour and a half commute each way. And I just, I just found it painful, right? even though I was very comfortable. So we often now talk about things at Ford and this notion of a design gap, and that something that was originally designed to get people from point A to point B is not so good at doing that anymore, even though the design of that vehicle has improved. The original purpose of transporting and freeing people is not there. So, so what do we do about that? Um, one of the things that's definitely changed uh, from today, and if you believe the demographers, um, people are increasingly gonna be moving to cities. Over half the, the world's population lives in cities today, and most people are predicting that's gonna go to 70% by 2050. And if that's the case, not everyone's going to be able to own their own car and drive when you've got 70% of the world's population living in a very dense uh, environment. And in fact, this is something that uh, our chairman, Bill Ford, who's the great grandson of our founder, said at a TED Talk in 2011. Uh, this is a great video to go back and look at. It's on YouTube. I actually, uh, I'll admit, I actually go back and watch this about once a quarter because when I start wondering why it is I've been engaging with cities. Why is it that we're doing these things uh, with multimodal transportation? You go back and watch it and go, all right, it kind of sets my moral compass back uh, in terms of my mission within the company and what my group is trying to do. But he basically conveyed that message that if all these people are gonna move to cities, how are we going to move them more efficiently? How are we gonna get smarter about transportation and how are cities gonna get smarter? And he, he did this before the advent, really, of Uber and Lyft and scooters and bike share. Uh, it was rather prophetic, 
uh, what he said. Uh, but given that he's a scion on a, of, a, on a, of an automotive legend, it was almost heretical to say that you know not everyone's going to be able to own their own car and that we're not going to sell single occupancy vehicles to move people around. Bill's a contrarian. Uh, for those of you that follow him, you know he's he's uh, very much an environmentalist, very much a conservationist, and he's often got this internal tension. You know, having been um, raised in a car company and leading a car company, how do we make that better, greener uh, for people? And, and the efforts that that we're doing now, I think, demonstrate that. Um, so the urban mobility challenges, which have been referenced uh, by many of the panelists here congestion and what that causes in terms of lost time. You know, different uh, organizations put dollar values on this. I'm sure Virginia Tech has studies that's done this. I know that um, Texas A&M and the traffic research uh, that they do. But um, sitting around in, in traffic jams um, can cost individuals up to $1,200 a year. Uh, traffic injuries, I think in 2016, the, the number of traffic fatalities was, was over 40,000. I believe the number last year was 37,000. But the figure that was presented earlier about those that are caused by weather, um, those are, that's 15% of the fatalities, uh, traffic fatalities that are out there are just weather-related ones, so it's a significant number. So all of these things are what cities are coping with in terms of their urban mobility challenges, and it's really, I think beginning to show because the the articles that you see today, especially as Congress considers uh, a highway uh, infrastructure bill and a, and a surface transportation bill, uh, this is all top of mind. You know, it's it's potholes, it's crumbling bridges, uh, it's our airports. Uh, there's a lot that has to be reinvested in the core infrastructure, and how do we? prepare and make that smarter uh, for, for what we think is a smarter future. So the things that we're concentrating on at Ford, um, this notion of population density, if more people are moving the cities, we've got to figure out ways to do that, move them around with what we would call um, greater, greater uh, efficiency and, and what I would like to say is, is trying to up the number of passenger miles traveled while vehicle miles traveled uh, doesn't necessarily go up that much. You want to you want to use more shared transportation as much as possible. So we continue to look for ways to say in the same footprint that we have a single occupancy vehicle, what are other things that we can provide it, whether those are shuttles, um, whether autonomous vehicles will carry two, three, four people. Our objective is to try and get more people and more goods, because that's the other half of this thing. It's not just moving people, it's moving goods through a city. Um, cities won't continue to grow if they're completely clogged. They, they, they have to be a living organism where things can come in and out and the things that we all consume and increasingly more and more things that are delivered to our houses as opposed to us retrieving them. Um, how are we gonna do that more efficiently if people are living in very dense areas? <clears throat> the rise of, of on-demand. So this is not only personal transportation, but it's food delivery. Um, you can pretty much get anything that you need on the gig economy pretty quickly. Uh, and that includes love for those people that use Tinder and, and other, other things like that. So this is, this is an important part of how we think about uh, how people will consume transportation is one of the things that um, if you, if, you, if you play out what transportation network companies are doing today, and ultimately uh, with the advent of autonomous vehicles, if that becomes a vehicle that's used in an Uber or Lyft uh, setting, again, how do we use that to not only be in the right place at the right time for people, but to respond to things like changing weather conditions, uh, that respond to things like changing construction conditions, and, and again, more efficiently uh, begin to move people throughout a city. Um, with all these new technologies, uh, there is just uh, a, an exponential increase in the amount of data. And it's not just data that's coming off the vehicle, it's, it's the data that, you, that people could collect you know, on us as commuters. Uh, origin destination data is very valuable. Uh, lots of companies would love to know that if you get out of a car and you, there's a choice of two coffee stations there, uh, one would like to incent you to, to go into the one to the left as opposed to the right, 
and try and make it worth your while if they knew you know, instantaneously what your geolocation was. So all of this data uh, has to be managed um, and we hope in, you know, there will be good stewards of this data, whether those are municipalities or the companies that you trust. Uh, but for us at Ford Motor Company, it's one of the things we aspire to be is one of the world's most trusted companies. And we're taking very great care with the data that's generated off the vehicle and the journeys and how that's, how that's curated and how that's used. But it goes beyond just the use of vehicles in this case. And then lastly, this notion of weather, uh, one of the reasons we're here, how do we layer that into the data that's gathered, the data that's available uh, to provide options to people? If, if typically you're a commuter and um, you're, you use a bike on rainy days, that's, that's not going to be your first choice. So uh, what are your options and, and what are the best ones to use, whether it's metro or bus or um, a, a transportation network company? And how, if we can predict weather, uh, begin to uh, beef up capacity on the other lines, knowing that people aren't going to be using uh, options that would expose them to the elements. So the last uh, slide that I have on this is really a, a picture that we use to, to kind of look at all of the, not, not necessarily all, it's not an exhaustive list, but if you look at a transportation ecosystem uh, in any large city, how can we begin to connect these disparate elements into something that can actually help people? One of the things that, that we've been working on uh, is this notion of a multimodal journey planner, that if I can type in, there are other companies that offer these things, but um, if I can type in, um, I need to go to point A to point B, have a list of what those options are, what their costs would be, what their uh, time, estimated time of arrival would be, how green they are, uh, if there's ways to incent people into one mode versus another because uh, maybe time is not as critical to them on that particular journey. This is what we're trying to do is really aggregate demand on one side of this uh, mobility equation as well as the supply of all the sources and begin to try and, and match that up so that things can move more efficiently within a city. Right now, it's, it's pretty chaotic because the only thing that gets aggregated maybe is people who are using Uber and Lyft at any one moment. Um, none of the scooter companies are, are integrated. For those of you that use them, you know, you're usually jumping from app to app to know uh, where the closest scooter might be. So we think that there's um, kind of a, a shining example on the hill or a city on the hill uh, where the data can be curated uh, carefully uh, where we give people better options in terms of how they get from point A to point B, and they can get there in the most efficient way that they can. So those are the things that we're working on with cities. And with that, I guess we'll turn it back over to the panel. Very good, thank you, John. Uh, we now have about 20 minutes for questions and answers, so I invite questions from the floor. Please state your name and your affiliation or association, so please. Questions for our panel? In the back. Hi. Um, I'm Jody Fisher. I work for uh, IBM Watson IoT in Smart Cities. Um, really excited about uh, the presentation that you just gave. Um, the, the last concept, uh, what, what did you call that? So that, that's uh, just a depiction of a mobility ecosystem in any city, and um, it's one that we developed in concert with Deloitte. So you'll probably see it in some of the Deloitte's presentations as well. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, how close are you to uh, putting that into to action? Um, I have another slide that shows kind of the, um, I think we've probably got that map covered 60 to 70 percent in terms of, of uh, demonstrable pilots and how we've connected things, but uh, it's very hard to go after that last, you know, 20, 30 percent. But uh, for those of you who've been following us, you know, we have our own individual vehicles, we're building AVs, we've got a scooter company, we've done bike share. Um, we're working on multimodal journey planning, we're working on an urban data platform. 
So these are the things that we're starting to try to connect to see, is there actually benefit to aggregating this data, both on the supply and demand side? And are you planning on rolling it out in any particular city first that we can see when it happens? <laughs> <laughs> we have it. We've, we've actually done this uh, in different places. So we haven't actually put it all together in one place, mm -hmm. but stay tuned. Great. Thanks. All right. Hi, uh, Sean Bath. I'm a UCAR employee, actually, um, working embedded with NOAA. And I work with a program called the RESA program that actually funds uh, teams regionally embedded with decision makers. So uh, related to that, I have my, my question is, uh, can you speak to, to, can any of you speak to the importance, um, perhaps, of, for this long-term planning uh, these conversations with decision makers themselves, how do you incorporate them into the research? How do you incorporate them into the development of these new technologies? How do you work it out so that they're doing the right, you know, they're on the right approach for long-term planning in the case of cities? Um, can you speak to the importance of that and can you speak to maybe the process for how you might do it? I'll go ahead and start with addressing this question. I, I can give an example in, in the the uh, federal highway funded um, maintenance decision support system program and everything that came out of the road weather research program was very stakeholder driven so from the very beginning of the dialogue about what are your needs and what decisions do you have to make um, capturing those needs and understanding how to communicate risk uncertainty um, how to how to design systems to actually get into their decision space because most of the stakeholders we're talking about certainly are not meteorologists. We don't want to make them meteorologists, but they have a lot of decisions to make that are, um, that are dependent on weather information. So I, I think it's best practice, and I think this, is in, this best practice is, is expanding, is to bring those stakeholders in right from the beginning of any solution you're going to design and then work the problem with the art of the possible discussion of what science and technology can be brought to bear on a solution so that when you deliver it, it's not the first time the end users see it, but it's already been designed, co-designed by them. And so um, the thing is, when you think about service transportation, the number of stakeholders is in the millions, and certainly the number of categories of end users are in the you know, tens of, if not hundreds of thousands. And so it's a big task to try to optimize information, but you still need to have good foundational core science and technology behind the solution, but there's a lot of social science that has to be done to build those bridges to make sure we're delivering things that are understandable and actionable. Yes. Angela? Yeah. Yeah. I would, um, it is an ongoing discussion with lots of, lots of stakeholders. And um, when I took the role, it wasn't just cities that we ended up talking to. You talked to state DOTs, you talked to regional planning organizations, you talk to uh, nonprofits, there's all kinds of stakeholders involved in these decisions, but um, it's great to have people engaged, you know, on, on the conversation. And uh, I think everyone wants to, to make their city smarter. We get a lot of questions at Ford about how do we prepare for autonomous vehicles? How do we prepare for connected vehicles? How do we continue to leverage the investments we've made in DSRC, but prepare for a 5G and connected vehicle CV to X future? So those are the things that we sit down and, and talk to a lot of people about. And, and I think we'll be, you know, here in DC, you'll see our um, Argo uh, AV pilot going around testing. Uh, and we've been asked uh, here quite a bit, you know, how can we help the region become smarter uh, and then utilize the AV as one of the many things on the in the internet of things you know that connects to that it's just it's only one piece of it right hi i'm anjali bamsai from the national science foundation i really enjoyed the last talk uh, i wanted to i like the concept of research uh, transportation research ecosystem so i wondered uh, but you were looking at just ground transportation and i wondered how you're interacting with let's say, metro or civil aviation, et cetera, and how's all that going to play, like weather and climate impact, that, those as well. So have you thought about, like, what would citizens do if, let's say, flights were canceled? Have you looked beyond ground to ground, just ground? 
Um, most of what we've done is is obviously focused on ground transportation because that's that's our domain space. But we have experimented uh, quite a bit with drones as well, both tethered and untethered drones in that airspace that Andy was talking about in 400 feet, uh, especially for goods delivery. You know, how can, how can we do that? Um, from, from a city to city, we haven't done a lot with civil avi aviation, although I think there's a lot to learn in terms of the meta systems and control systems that are in place there, especially when it comes to designing systems that are, are going to help cities manage large fleets of autonomous vehicles. You know, think of the equivalent of a ground FAA for, you know, AVs and what cities or some entity that they commission is going to have to do. Um, so to that extent, I think our research group has had a lot of conversations with the FAA and, um, you know, trying to learn, you know, from the, from the history and the development of that. Um, in terms of city to city transportation, this is not something that gets a lot of discussion, you know, from, a, from, a, from an AV standpoint. But if you can think of dedicated lanes where autonomous vehicles could travel at high rates of speed, um, I think it does provide additional options for people, much like high-speed rail would right now. Uh, I much prefer to take the Acela from here to New York, especially if I have to be downtown, than, than having to fly there. But um, having come from Detroit, um, it's, it's usually a push whether you drive to Chicago or take a flight, because by the time that you go to the airport, park your cars, go through security, fly, and then you know, do the, the same thing on the other side, uh, it's typically four hours, and I can drive to Chicago in four hours, and the, the variables are weather, the variables are uh, traffic, um, but if I can, can begin to control and manage some of those variables, at least dedicated lanes, if you think about the, the medians you know, in, in highways, if we had dedicated lanes of autonomous vehicles, we could get people there maybe in two and a half to three hours and, and have smaller... We've, we've taken a seller or Amtrak and maybe breaking bulk down to more personalized transportation. So those are some of the things that we've envisioned, but you know, don't have a timeline for anything like that. Hi, uh, Paul Pisano, uh, formerly uh, road weather manager of the Federal Highway Administration, recently retired. Um, great presentations all, and um, I guess Touching on some of the points that Kathy talked about, I think actually all of you talked about data and the importance of data and having that situation awareness of what's happening now and what's going to happen with regards to the road. And a lot of what we've done in the past with the maintenance decision support system and working with DOTs, it's been open data shared fairly freely once you can get through all the hurdles to do that. But um, as we see systems emerge like what you were describing, John, it, it, uh, the private sector plays a much uh, more active role in uh, that data space. And I'm just wondering, how do we envision a system that is going to be um, available to all so that it's not going to be um, providing preferred information to one source over another? And, and maybe not so much preferred, but I'm thinking of, as well about a, a presentation I heard from North Carolina DOT as they were managing their road network under the, all the flooding that happened last fall. And they, they, they were doing an excellent job, but they were sharing their data mostly with Waze, which was great if you were a Waze user, but if you relied on TomTom Tom or Inrix or some other source, you're not going to be getting the same information about which roads are flooded and which aren't. So I'm wondering, how do we imagine this data, uh, immense data world that needs to be open and free and accessible so that the safety of the, of the traveling public is not diminish. I'm wondering any thoughts about any, how that may play out. Manny, do you want to go on it? I can tell you. I, I can tell you in Virginia, they're, they've taken a different tact with the data that they're, instead of pushing it out to someone like Waze only, they're actually putting it at a, a publicly accessible portal where anybody can pull that data and use it in their app. And so they're being basically application agnostic. So, and I really feel like that's the way we need to head with any data that's, you know, gathered with taxpayer money, basically. So I think that's a good model. I don't know how many other states are doing it. Data sharing is certainly really important. I mean, we, what we're really trying to talk here about in terms of weather, and there's a lot of data sharing, open data sharing that occurs around the world with our weather information as well in the United States, and we're a leader in that. 
but we also need to share information from the vehicles to help inform the micro prediction and diagnostics we have to do to have this seamless diagnostic and prediction system to serve all transportation modes. So data sharing is critical, and I think it's, there'll be some, some work ahead of us legally to make sure we have data sharing agreements that protect everyone's rights in, in this data sharing world. But to raise the tide for everybody in terms of the fidelity of the information produced, data sharing is something that we need to do. It could be completely anonymous data, as long as we understand a little bit about its quality so we can use it effectively. Um, but as a scientist, I always want more data. But as we start taking products, and, and not just weather products, but service transportation mobility products or safety products, you need the information from that part of the ecosystem as well. So data sharing is certainly something that is, is going to be promoted, and we've already demonstrated in some research how um, in, important it is. In the aviation world, there's data shared from commercial airlines that help then provide better predictions of wind speed and turbulence and icing and, and such that's really good for flight planning operations. So uh, there's plenty of evidence showing that data sharing helps raise the tide for everybody, and we want to promote that concept. I guess from a DOT perspective, and I might be stepping outside of my box a little bit on this, but it still boils down to uh, who's going who's to look at the accuracy of this data. You talk about the fidelity of it. And I'm like, if the DOT is pushing this out to a vehicle, connected vehicles or autonomous vehicles, based on what they've gotten in from other vehicles, who's going to, who's, where's, where's the liability with that at this point? And that's, I think, a big question that needs to be answered, you know, because um, most DOTs aren't set up for that at this point. All right. Uh, so what you've heard today uh, is that scientists, oh, one more question. Oh, sorry. Uh, Susan Avery, uh, formerly president of Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, now retired. Um, and I'm back in Boulder, Colorado. But, um, you know, um, no one's talked about the sensors, um, the quality of the sensors, the types of sensors, the weather sensors, the mobility sensors. I have a car relatively pur new purchased, and the sensors are terrible. They're unreliable. It takes me forever to get them fixed. I hope it's People not don't know how to, how to do this. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so, I, so I'm kind of sitting there thinking, would I have confidence in all of this when I know that my sensors, the suite of sensors that I have, are really not working that well, and nor are they able to basically repair them? So tell me a little bit about where you see the technology going in an, it, a very complex integrated sensor package, particularly if you're going to put now weather sensors and other types of sensors on the car um, for mobility and control. Um, and, and give me some sense that I should feel confident about the sensors in my car. Do you want a better sense of your sensors? Is my, and my, my car is not a Ford. It's, right. it's, it's a Subaru. Okay. Oh. All right. You live in Boulder. And, and, well, yeah, that's a requirement. Um, I... I, I uh, borrow a phrase, I feel that pain because I, I rely, with the increasing number of sensors that are on our vehicles, I become very reliant on them. Um, my children have never had to back up a car without a camera, you know, on the head unit. And when I go and rent cars, sometimes I have to, I have to do this and it, it's annoying, right? But uh, the other part that they obviously come in handy is in parking. But during inclement weather, which we get a lot of in Michigan, those sensors get covered. Right, so how do you, you know, how do you uh, protect against that? Um, some manufacturers have, have uh, attached washer systems, you know, small jet sprays to try and relieve that, but that's not necessarily going to, to uh, relieve it all the time, especially if you run out of windshield wiper fluid, there's all these failure modes. So I think um, with regards to autonomous, it comes down to systems of redundancy. So you have LIDAR, radar, photo, and then I think increasingly over time, uh, you begin to rely on the edge and the network and a, and a network of connected objects that aren't just vehicles, but the connections to infrastructure, connections to other objects in that environment, uh, whether they're bikes or scooters. Um, the uh, accident that was referenced earlier in Phoenix um, the uh, individual was misidentified. They didn't know if it was a bike or a person or what was crossing. 
But imagine if that person was likely carrying a cell phone and it identified her as an object in that network. It really didn't matter what, what it was. They would have known there was something in the road and the vehicle could have slowed down before its sensors had to be relied on to pick that up. So I think that's, that's what we're evolving to is that there'll be this, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't answer the question about liability, but this world where there's, a lot, there's gonna be a lot of codependency on data um, and, and data location as we, as we begin to become more connected. And I think what we as consumers have to struggle with is we tend to want things for free. Or you know, one of the, the great uh, new economic principles, I think, is that software tends toward free. It wants to be free. But you have to give up something for free. You know, when you search on Google, they're gathering information in terms of what you've searched for and monetizing that in various ways. But you don't pay for search, you know, directly. So we have to think about, in the mobility space, what we're willing to deal with from a privacy standpoint and what we want to pay for versus what we want to get for free. Um. I was just going to add, um, we kind of had a conversation about this earlier. Um, you have all those sensors on your vehicle. What happens if, when you get hit? We, the, we don't have the insurance agencies represented here, the insurance. And I, I can only imagine, I live in Wyoming, and I've already replaced one car due to hail. Um, and I can only imagine what would happen. And so you get all these sensors, and you don't really know when they're going to go bad because you don't know what, what's driving you know, it could have got hit with a rock, and you didn't know that. So, yeah, I, I, I understand what you're, you're saying, but that's, that's a big thing. And, and like I said, the insurance in, industry isn't at this table right now, and that's going to be a big impact to people. Well, it's also, it's also training people in the maintenance area to really, I mean, it's, it's a different level of education. Yeah. Because they don't have the testing that's going to happen. That was what my frustration is. I almost had to take the car in four times before someone could identify the problem. Yeah. So, so it seems to me that there's kind of a disconnect. You've got to have to go through the whole chain of sophistication and development to those that, that are going to be able to maintain these and, and I think I think what you're saying is true. I, we see this in a DOT standpoint. You know, we have maintenance guys. They drive the plow. They maintain the fences. They do they do the the hard work. Yeah. They're the lowest paid people at the DOT. And now we're asking them with with winter maintenance activities to be physicists and chemists. And I'm like, you're 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 not recognizing that that's what we're asking them to do. And, and, and so I think that there is a, a, there needs to be this whole cultural shift and these aren't just mechanics and these aren't, you know, just the service industry that these people are actually performing valuable work that we rely on more and more. And so I, I think, you know, what you're saying, you know, if I had to take my car in for four, four times for one thing, I'd be, I'd take it off. I don't want to need it, so. All right, we have time for one last question. This is for Kathy, more than anything else. Um, Tom, who are you? Everyone knows who I am. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, friend of the weather industry. Um, Kathy, um, have the State Departments of Transportation developed any consensus uh, in terms of paying for the infrastructure? Yeah. Uh, this is going to be a massive build-out of infrastructure across the country to accommodate autonomous vehicles. Has there been any discussion with the state DOTs regarding that issue? Um, I'm not at that level. I'm kind of the boots on the ground person, but I can tell you that from my experience, there probably isn't a whole lot going on. Every state does something different. They do it slightly different. They have a different population. They have different expectations within that population. Um, John talked about the population density. 2014, the popula population density of Cheyenne or Wyoming was six people per square mile. Washington, D.C., that's 10,800. So the whole, you know, what your expectations are in your population are different. And so how we are going to do things in Wyoming is going to be different than they're going to be in Iowa. It's going to be different than they are in Pennsylvania. You know, our climates are different. Our, you know, the expectations of drivers are different. And, and I think that's going to be the hardest thing. I, I don't know. Um, Paul could probably speak to the 80 coalition that we had. Yeah. We don't know what we're building to. Yeah. We don't have the 
don't have the requirements from the automated vehicle community to say this is what we need, in part because there's you know half a dozen or probably a dozen different manufacturers all doing approaching it differently as captured in Andy's style. So there's no there's no consensus because we don't know what the design needs are. That's that's one of the most common questions I hear uh, going on talking about autonomous vehicles is questions from even down to the locality levels. They're asking how should we spend our transportation money to accommodate autonomous vehicles, and right now there are no good guidelines on that. And it's very different too between say urban settings, rural settings, heavy vehicles, light vehicles. So it's it's not a simple question. There was uh, this is a. Shameless plug for the DC Auto Show, which is going on this week. So uh, tomorrow is Public Policy Days, and I think all federal employees, in the afternoon, um, if you just simply register, you can go see what's on display. But today we announced, uh, in conjunction with SAE, uh, GM, Ford, and Toyota announced a joint safety standards initiative on AVs, and I think from that will come uh, some of these things, not all of all of probably what people are seeking. Uh, but the industry recognizes, too, that there has to be more collaboration on this front if we're really going to uh, see the advent of these things, you know, in the, in the near. All right. Thank you all. Uh, you know, kind of picking up on some of the comments we've heard at the end, you know, we've been discussing this afternoon, and we've, we've heard about the rapid pace of technological change. And that's driving the need for improved, more detailed, higher resolution uh, weather forecasts. And in this city, and it was just mentioned by Tom, in this city there's a lot of discussion about infrastructure. Right? It's become a buzzword. But for the most part, that's from a, a civil engineering perspective. And, and talking about sensors, you know, infrastructure is necessary, but it's far from sufficient. And as a nation, we need to move from infrastructure to infrastructure to take advantage of this information. And then from our perspective, to do that, you know, as Bill mentioned, we need a nationally coordinated research program in order to exploit this information so that we can provide these improved, more detailed forecasts uh, to advance the predictions, but then also keep sustaining um, the economy. So again, I think a lot of pieces are in place, but we, we do uh, need to find a way to bring it all together. And with that, I'd like to thank all our speakers. Thank all of you for attending. Uh, please come up to uh, and approach any of our speakers or any of the UCAR staff if we can provide any further information. So thank you all.